Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Dr. Thomas Hemingway here. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. All right. Today's show is such a special gift. We have a wonderful human and somebody who's been around the areas of fasting, biohacking, nutrition. She's an actress, a best-selling author, a podcaster. Melanie Avalon is on the show today. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you so much for having me, Thomas. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my gosh. Such a pleasure to get to chat with you. Appreciate you. I would love to, especially for our audience's sake, kind of hear a little bit about your journey of how you got so interested in the health stuff, the biohacking, the fasting, like how did that all work out for you? Seemed like you discovered it pretty early on. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, it was. <laughs> it was early on. I was doing like all these things before they were colloquial and well-known like they are today. Um, but like a lot of people, I feel like I have a very similar story to a lot of people, which is my own health issues and challenges um, led me to try to find answers for myself and really got me involved in the, like the biohacking world today, because I was just looking for things that would make me feel better. And I just became really obsessed with all of these tools and techniques and things that we can do that just really revolutionize health and our experience of life. And I'm the type of person that just loves sharing things with people and just everything I learn and experience, I just want to tell people. And so the podcasting medium and platform was perfect for that, which as, as you know, having your own show. Um, so yeah, it, that's really how the, the biohacking stuff started and the fasting, um, came about because I historically growing up had always been trying a lot of different diets. And when I first went low carb a, a while ago, um, I that was the first time that I finally realized the effect that food had on our constitution, not just weight loss per se. And then I became really obsessed with the science of diet. And I first tried intermittent fasting about 10 years ago I was going to just do it for one week. I was going to do one meal a day. Um, and I never stopped because it was that amazing. Um, so yeah, everything just sort of like weaved together to lead to where I am now. Well, that's, that's amazing. I know for me, it's funny to think about, but as a kid, I practiced time restricted feeding for my whole, you know, first 20 years of life. And I didn't even know I was doing it. This was not as extreme as OMAD or, or something quite that narrow with the window. But I, I did like a 14 hour window every night because we ate dinner at five o'clock and I didn't eat breakfast until seven or seven 30 the next morning. And my mom was like, she was hardcore. We had a lock, like an actual lock on our refrigerator. Oh, wow. And so, and so <laughs> After dinner, well, there were there were a bunch of us uh, young men, and we would eat everything. My there's five of us brothers in the family, then I have one sister, and we would just eat everything in sight. And so I think it was partly to make sure we had food to last till the end of the month. <laughs> wow! And then, and then partly just to kind of keep things a little bit more regimented. In other words, if we didn't eat our 5 p.m. dinner, that was it. Like we just missed out. And so <laughs> we came in from playing, and we ate our dinner, and then you know, did our usual evening routine and we'd never even thought about it, you know, and it was, it was magical for us. We were all super healthy. And then later in life, I, I have, like I said, the five brothers of, of, and they've all struggled with weight. And it's been kind of sad because they've not continued these kinds of, you know, hacks, if you will, the fasting and things like that. And so I actually have a brother right now who's morbidly obese and, you know, we all have the same upbringing. We have the same genes and, you know, I've been now on the journey to help him for several years and he's made improvements with diet and things. And, and so it's been cool to watch, but yeah, it was interesting because nobody ever talked about that kind of stuff back then yet. It's always been helpful, right? Like we came from a, uh, I hate to say, you know, ancestral point of view, I think that gets overused, but we never used to eat 16 hours a day. Like we do in the Western world today. And so you 10 years ago, that was way before most of this had really been talked about. Um, when you started it, was it, was it like, oh my gosh, this is working so amazing. Or was it really rough transition? Like what was that initial week? Like, yeah. Um, well, first of all, just a comment on your experience. A lot of people say that not, well, not the lock on the, yeah. <laughs> not the actual lock. That's the first for me. Um, yeah. but a lot of people say that they, you, like once they learn about intermittent fasting, they realize they've sort of been doing it without realizing they were doing it and that it worked for them. Um, 
but that lock story is very cool. <laughs> um, so wait, sorry. Now I forgot the, the question oh, was, so um, when you first, first started, was it? Super, oh yeah. Was it like, hard or not? Yeah. Um, so I thought it was going to be so hard. I remember psyching myself out and being like, <laughs> it's really funny to think about because I remember the night before doing it, I was like, okay, I'm like not going to eat tomorrow until dinner. And this is <laughs> like, it was like this really big thing. Um, <laughs> And it was really, it was easy for me. So I had granted, like I said, I had been doing low carb before that. So I was sort of fat adapted probably, which probably made it a little bit easier. But I do remember the first day um, I was in film school at USC and I decided to do it while I was working on one of my friend's film sets and it was fine. I just, I just went to the film set. I stayed busy. I drank like tons of tea and coffee and it was yeah, it was really easy. I remember just thinking, wow, I have so much more time and this is so much more easier. This is so much easier than just eating like yeah. all throughout the day. And I'm less hungry. Um, and I get to eat all I want at night. So it was fabulous. <laughs> um, yeah. And I went through a period, <laughs> I went through a period of time in college where I, I lived right by a Ralph's, which is kind of like a Kroger um, grocery store yeah. in, in California. And um, they would mark down the rotisserie chickens to like $3 every night at 11 PM. And so I had night classes. So like after the night class, I would like bike over to Ralph's and like get a rotisserie chicken for $3 and that would be my dinner. And I did that for like six months. Like that's all I ate. <laughs> It was oh great. Oh my gosh, that is so awesome. Wow. I, you know, you mentioned something that is one of my favorite aspects of this type of, you know, eating the narrowed window, intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding, whatever you want to call it, is the simplicity. Like literally, if you narrow that window, there's way less food to plan for, to buy. And when you have kids to clean up after, like it's so much simpler. It frees you up for so much more in your life. And you're energized. I mean, it's such a magical thing. One of the things I, I, I wanted to talk to you about, because I have a lot of women listeners who have been experimenting with this, tweaking with it. And I wonder, have you noticed, especially, you know, you've been doing this over a decade now that you've kind of tweaked things throughout time where maybe a super, super narrow window, like you were talking about the OMAD thing where you're eating one meal a day was kind of what you're doing. Have you changed that over time? I've noticed with women, sometimes it's a little different, especially with types of, you know, hormonal cycles during the month and things like that, where there's certain times where they probably don't want to be doing it as strict and things like that. Have you noticed that with yourself and, and then in all your experience with others with this, what, what have you noticed? Yeah. So that's a really great question and a great topic to touch on because there's definitely, especially when it comes to women and fasting, a lot of fear out there that it's, um, you know, going to be detrimental for women or that th there's a lot of things that you should, that you should consider. And appropriately enough, actually on my show, um, the Melanie Avalon biohacking podcast, the episode that aired today, not that this is airing, but that you and I are recording. Um, it's with Megan Ramos, who works with Jason Fung. Uh, they wrote the book Life in the Fasting Lane. And that whole episode that is airing today is all about women and fasting. And um, my co-host, Cynthia Thurlow on the Intermittent Fasting Podcast talks a lot. Her book, Intermittent Fasting Transformation, is all about women and fasting. So there's a lot of information and content there. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts on it. But for me personally, so I... I feel like there are different types of people. Like some people are more, there's like extremists and there's moderationists. Um, and the extremist people tend to do well, obviously with extremes, whereas moderationists can do, you know, do better with like flexibility and more intuitive, more intuitive eating. I am an extremist. So <laughs> my fasting this whole time, um, has really been the one meal a day. I, in the beginning I did, I was more neurotic about counting hours. Like I would really count the <laughs> fasting hours. And I really wanted to make sure that I fasted a minimum of, I don't even know what it was at the time, X pro probably like 20 hours minimum. So I would really count that. Wow. Um, now I just do the one meal a day approach. I don't really count hours. Um, I just eat dinner every night as much as I want. And as long as I want, um, that said, I think that um, women can women compared to men are more likely to. Um, well, I should backtrack and say that I, I think uh, fasting in general is 
very, very helpful for women. Um, I think the fear that's out there is based more on women that go too restrictive in general with everything rather than the fasting per se. Um, and there's so many studies, especially on things like PCOS and women and fasting, just finding profound benefits. And when I interviewed Megan Ramos, she was talking about how they use fasting to help women with fertility issues and, um, you know, fasting can be great for balancing hormones, but it does come back to what I was saying a second ago about how you can be overly restrictive. Um, so fasting is not necessarily overly restrictive, but you can be overly restrictive with your fasting, I think. Um, so I think it's really important to pay attention to, are you eating enough in your eating window? Um, when it comes to macronutrients, are you good with low carb? Some women are great with low carb, but some people do better with more carbs. And that's something for me that has changed. So I historically was doing the low carb fasting for a really long time. And then I went, I flipped and went super high carb and I'm actually very high carb. Now I tend to do a higher carb, low fat approach. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important that women are really in tune with their bodies and, making sure they're nourishing themselves, nourishing themselves, getting the macronutrients they need. Um, there's definitely a lot to pay attention to. Yeah, no, totally. And I think that you said a couple of golden things there, as far as you got to listen to your body. There's no one exact approach for everybody. And you got to know your personality too. If you're more of the sort of person on the extreme end, that's going to want to have the most narrow window possible, or if you're somebody that's more moderate and just kind of go with what works for you. And of course, always when you are eating, be mindful of eating real food, right? The whole foods that we love to talk about that don't have really an ingredient label because you don't need one. It's just whatever it is. It's a, it's a pineapple. If you're into that, or it's a berries, strawberries, or it's, you know, avocado is one of my favorite go-tos as far as fruit. I don't know why I've just always loved avocado or, or nuts, macadamia nuts, or uh, probably because I've been in Hawaii so long, but it's one of my favorites. Um, as far as healthy fats go and things like that. But tell me about, a little bit more. That was interesting. You said you were, you were very low carb for many years and now you're eating much more carbs. What, what's your primary source of carbs nowadays? I am a huge fruit lover. So <laughs> I find that, um, when it comes to the carbs, some people do better on like the starchier approach. So like squashes and rice and things like that. Mm. And then some people, do well with fruit. Like I find it really interesting because some people, um, like more complex carbs are more satiating and make them feel better, but then other people do better with the more simple, like the fruit. Um, so yeah, I am like, I eat pounds and pounds of fruit every night and that's not an exaggeration. Um, I What's totally your favorite? agree. What are um, your favorite so fruits? I, I went through a pineapple phase where I was like eating all the pineapples. Like it was crazy. <laughs> um, my tongue would be a wreck every single night from the enzymes. Um, but the bromelain in the pineapple was just so anti-inflammatory. Um, but I've been doing a lot of blueberries that's for the past probably few years. So just like pounds and pounds of blueberries. Um, yeah, I digest them really well, but I'm like, you, like you were saying about the whole foods. I think that's so, so important. I, I just can't, emphasize enough how important that is. Yeah. And, and with the fruit too, um, everything you mentioned was a whole fruit. I know back in the day, I, like everybody kind of went through a juicing phase and I almost drink no juice anymore. I just eat real fruit and you know, there's juice in there, but you're getting the whole profile, right? You're getting the fiber, you're getting the micro and the macronutrients. And, um, I don't know if you've interviewed Ben Bickman before, but probably you have, he, he loves to say, you know, always eat your fruit, don't drink it, you know, and he's, he wrote the, the book about basically insulin resistance. And, uh, I've always kind of in the recent decade been paying attention to that. I don't really juice anymore. Um, but I'm not opposed to people who do, if they're eating the pulp too, you know, like buying juices, I'm not a fan of buying juices because usually they leave out all the fiber and the pulp and things like that. And they just have the juice part, which is super, you know, usually throws your blood sugar into a, a super big, you know, um, elevation and then the insulin elevation. Do you ever monitor that sort of thing? Do you wear a CGM or have you done that? And what, what have been your sort of takeaways from CGM if you've used one? Yeah, I, well, I, yeah, I have interviewed Dr. Bickman. I love him. He's so amazing. Um, for anybody who wants to just get the deepest dive into insulin, his book is incredible. Um, yes, I love continuous glucose monitors. Have you, have you worn them a yeah. few times? Yeah, yeah, I have. I don't, I don't continue to do it always, but it's, it was eye opening for me. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's I I really recommend that everybody at least at least do like a, a two week trial um because they usually they usually last about two weeks. And um I remember when I first did it, I was like obsessed and I think I wore them. I I did it for like months and months. Um, but then you get kind of like CGM fatigue and you're like, okay, gotta take a breather. Yeah. Um, but I actually did it again more recently, a recent round, and it was really exciting to see how things had changed. Um but as far as the I, I the reason I really love continuous glucose monitors is it, it it's such it, it's so much accountability in your face. Like it it actually makes it very real the understanding of oh, like because you can hear like, oh, I'm eating this and it's spiking my blood sugar. Like, but that's very vague. But yeah. when you're wearing a continuous glucose monitor, you literally see, oh, I ate this and what like you see what happens to your blood sugar. Um and then I think a lot of people are really fascinated to see their blood sugar, especially during fasting. A lot of people will experience high blood sugars um, while fasting or particularly with high intensity exercise that people get confused about, but that's just from, you know, the liver dumping glycogen for, for that intense exercise. Um, people see spikes like the Dawn effect and especially with their morning coffee. So I, yeah, I love uh, continuous gluco glucose monitors. I'm a big fan. Yeah, no, it's, I, I find them so intriguing all of the things, the food is the beginning part, right? You get to kind of find out what specifically for you is a good, you know, I, I, I used to like oatmeal and not just like a regular, it was like the steel cut oatmeal, like they're real kind of raw, kind of hearty stuff. And I'd put blueberries and raspberries and, and that's it. I wouldn't even do any sugar. I didn't do any maple, um, honey, none of that. I just sweeten it with only just fresh berries. And I found that that was really a big spike for me. Like it was like 180 sometimes, 175. I mean, I was like, holy crap, like oh, wow. it's supposed to be good for me. And I'm like, my sugar is usually good with almost everything else. And so I stopped eating oatmeal. Like to this day, I don't really ever have oatmeal. I'll cook it for my kids if they ask for it or what have you. But I just, I'm like, well, that just didn't really work for me. So sometimes there's some, some surprises that I think we'll find, which is kind of cool because it's individual. It's immediate. Like you said, the feedback will, will know right away. The other cool thing I was noticing is that just with those super simple, like, you know, 10 minute walks after you eat, if you have a little spike, I mean, it's amazing how fast your sugar comes down. If you just go for a simple walk, like just really easy, simple things that, that just, I don't know, when you see it on yourself, it just means more. I'm with you. Like just seeing that number and having that immediacy, like, oh, okay. Like now rubber meets the road. I get it. Okay. Like that's really, really helpful. So yeah, what a, what a fun thing, what a fun thing to do. And I think it's the future, really a lot of these wearables and I don't know, um, sometimes I think we can get, like you said, a little bit fatigued with it. I think we can kind of do too much sometimes and get a little bit fanatical about, you know, always tracking our sleep and our steps and our blood sugar and our, this and our, that's, and it's like, sometimes it's a little bit too much. Um, but I think there's so much information that's out there. And I think when you compile it, together and you look at, you know, thousands and thousands of people and see what their, um, response is, even if you can't ever get a wearable yourself, you can make a pretty good educated guess based on data that's been collected, like through the levels program, for example, they have huge databases and a few others that are doing this. I think it's really interesting. Has that been kind of your uh, experience as well? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you um, brought that up with your experience with the oatmeal. Cause, um, I think something that's really important to point out to people is just how unique and individual people's reactions are to different foods. Um, so because you might find that you, and that there was a really great study on this actually back in the early days of CGMs where they were looking, I think it was called like personalized glucose response or something, but they were using CGMs and looking at all these different foods and how people reacted. And it was all over the board. Like some people would react super high to like an orange and not a cookie. And then other people would be like the complete <laughs> reverse. And um, so I really encourage people again to, to get one because you can see how you respond. And, and like, for me, for example, I am literally eating, I like I mentioned like pounds of fruit at night and I don't really spike that high. And I think a lot of people like in the low carb world would say, you know, that that's like not possible, but I, I do think context is key. Cause I am doing it like in a low fat approach, which I think is, um, kind of important, at least for me. Um, but yeah, the, the, the results are definitely just, they can be all over the board. So I think it's really important that people do it for themselves to see what's happening. And, and yes, I agree about the, the overwhelm that can happen. And, um, I've definitely have gone through periods where I was like, 
wanting to track everything and then nothing. And um, I feel like I'm at a really good place now where I feel really comfortable with what I'm doing. Like I wear an aura ring and I, mm-hmm. I love that. Um, but I try not, I try to see everything that I'm toying with or playing with as like nothing that I, I think the issue for me or, and that can happen to a lot of people is I don't ever want to feel like I have to have or do all of these things like that. I need them to be healthy. Rather. I just want to see everything as additive if that, if that makes sense. So um, like with all the biohacking type stuff, I try to just see it as like, Oh, this can enhance my life rather than I have to have this to be a healthy person. Yeah, no, so important. And if you can take advantage of some of these things, even if they might be for a window of time, not necessarily forever, I think we can learn a lot of lessons from it. You mentioned the the aura ring. Have you been surprised with your numbers there? I don't know how long you've been wearing one, but I've I've read a lot of your stuff and listened to you. And I know you tend to be more of a night person. Mm-hmm. So how how has that played into the numbers you get and how do they always correlate with how you feel? Because that's kind of always been my experience, is it kind of needs to have some kind of correlation too. And I think over time, the more you use it, the more it kind of makes sense. But what's been your experience with that? Yeah. So I, how long, I probably been wearing an aura ring. I don't know, maybe a year and a half or two years. Um, I was so nervous about getting one because I thought it was going to make me neurotic. But I, what I really like about aura is I, I like the way it like talks to you. Like, I like the way it phrases things. It's, it's very comforting. Like it never makes you feel like you're in a really awful place. Um, excuse me. Um, so I have found that it does correlate pretty well to how I'm feeling. Um, a few thoughts about that. I, it, it was fascinating to experience COVID while wearing an aura ring because it, I mean, I was very impressed. I was like, oh, it really does know. Um, <laughs> because my my heart rate variability and my readiness score just plummeted. And it was so cool to be able to track the my sickness progression with COVID and see like when my when my body was actually recovered. Um, and then on the the sleep side of things, something I really like about aura is like you mentioned, I am a super night owl. Um, which I have finally just accepted and I just go with it. Um, but what I like about aura is it doesn't try to make you a morning person. Like literally my aura ring will be like your bedtime tonight is 3 AM. Like it, <laughs> I, the other night oh, I felt so, I guess I've been going to bed later than even that. So the other night it was like, maybe you should go to bed a little bit earlier tonight, like 3 15 AM. I was like, Oh dear. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do find that it, it correlates pretty well. And I always look at it unless there's a situation where I, if there's a situation where I know I got really, really awful sleep and I need to be productive that day, I sometimes don't look at it that day because I, I don't want to just reaffirm how little sleep I got. Um, but that's very, that's rare. Um, but that's how I hack it. (laughs) Otherwise I look at it every day. Awesome. Yeah. No, you don't want to start your day off thinking, oh crap, it's going to be this or that way. And you know, if you got to get a bunch done, you got this huge list of things. It's like, yeah, you want to tip the odds in your favor and maybe check that when you're done for the evening or the weekends here or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That makes that makes perfect sense. Well, while we're on the topic of sort of biohacking and these sorts of things, I, I wanted to ask you, and I was just curious if you've noticed, and maybe it's just one or two things. I don't know if there's 10 things, but I, in my experience, I've noticed over the years that there's more and more of a role for some supplementation in our lives. I used to be kind of anti-supplement. I was kind of like the food Nazi. It has to come from food. I don't think any of these things should be you know, taken separately. You should always look for ways to get it from your food. And I'm still a food first guy, but I can tell you there's a few supplements I do take and I found very helpful for me personally and for, for many others that I've worked with. But is is there any particular ones that you like? What is your thoughts just in general on the whole sort of supplementation um, possibilities that are out there today? Yeah. So I had a really similar experience to you with one slight stepping stone before that. So I feel like I probably first was like pretty big on the supplement train when I first discovered the world of supplements and especially in the beginning of my days of experimenting with diet and biohacking and all of that, then I became very food focused like you. Um, and I was like, everything has to come from food. Like we shouldn't, you know, need supplements. Um, now I have, I think a more nuanced approach, which sounds probably similar to where you've landed, which is I realize 
because I mean, there are different types of supplements. There's, you know, more performance based ones and like longevity ones and mitochondria boosters, but then there's things like the actual nutrition, so like vitamins and things like that. And I like to acknowledge now that, um, in the ideal world, we would get all of our nutrients from food, like hands down, like that's just how it would be. Um, but our world is not ideal and there are quite a few nutrients that can be really difficult to get even on like the best of best with whole foods diets. So I'm all for smart supplementation. Um, on the nutrient side of things, like with the vitamins, I do think there are a few supplements that most people across the board are probably deficient in. Um, like magnesium would be one for people, unless they're getting adequate sun exposure, vitamin D might be one. Um, but honestly, beyond those two nutrient ones, I think it's really individual and people should be really smart and probably test and see um, if they need to be taking supplements, nutritional ones, and or looking at, you know, putting their diet in like chronometer or something and seeing where they're at with their nutrition. Um, and then on the other side of the supplement coin, so things that are not necessarily nutrients, I'm, I think there are a few things that can be really great for, you know, longevity and, um, like that, like I'm really big on the NMN and our train now with, uh, <laughs> supporting NAD levels, yeah. um, I'm really, my first supplement that I made was serapeptase, which is a proteolytic enzyme. I think that has a lot of benefits, um, just whole body benefits. Then there might be things like berberine, where if you want to work on like blood sugar control. So I just, I think it should be all very, um, smart and I'm not a fan of multivitamins. Um, I, yeah. So, yeah, because like, them, cause most of them are no good. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy what you can yeah, get and, and, and Cause you a, you don't really know exactly what you're getting. B, you don't know what you actually need. So then you might be getting, you know, too high levels of some things. Um, I I'm just, yeah, I'm not, especially after, oh, this, this was crazy. I, um, interviewed recently, Mark Schatzker. He wrote a book called the Dorito effect. And then his new book is called the end of craving. His book will, it's one of the most, the biggest paradigm shifts I've had, um, like ever in the nutritional world. He basically makes the case that fortification of foods with vitamins is like partly responsible for the obesity epidemic, which is like shocking. Um, so yeah, I have a really, I have have a lot of thoughts about supplementation. Yeah, no, that I, I'm, I'm very in a similar sort of uh, phase and also approach to that because, I, I was, when I was in the phase where I was anti all supplements and I just, you know, it's a waste of money. You got to get it from your food. Um, I would purposely go to these, you know, nutrition shops, whatever they were, GNC, you know, vitamin shop, all those kind of places. And I would look at their, you know, multi and you're right. Most of them are total garbage that everything was synthetic. There was not a, an actual bioavailable form of folate there ever, nor B12 was never methylated. And and just the quality of the stuff I was looking at, I'm like, Oh my gosh, why would I spend money on this stuff? And so that sort of fueled my, you know, real food first and all that. But as I've gotten older, I'm, (laughs) I'm turning 50 next year. I've, I've really appreciated that there are some supplements that most of us could use and magnesium is always on my top three list uh, as well as vitamin D. And I usually can get that from the sun, especially when I'm in Mm. Hawaii, but uh, winter months, sometimes when we travel like this year, we're going to be away from Hawaii for a time. And I'm going to be taking vitamin D three because I know I'm not going to be getting enough. And then I feel like the omegas uh, for most people, they can benefit because it's hard unless you are incorporating a lot of healthy proteins like wild caught fish and these kinds of things in your diet, it's kind of hard to get enough. We get plenty of the omega sixes, but the omega threes, sometimes we're deficient in. And I found that that's, those are sort of my top three right there. And you mentioned two out of three of those. And the third is omegas, which I try to get from fish, but I'll be honest, if I'm away from Hawaii, I just, I'm a little bit spoiled. I just don't eat fish or seafood unless I'm near the ocean. <laughs> that's just kind of my, my thing. Cause if it's not freshly caught, I'm like, eh, maybe not. But, um, yeah, that's another one of my top ones. And then I think now you mentioned this, but the cool thing is there's so much testing out there where you can really be more specific and kind of personalize it to the individual, which I think is super, super helpful. So while we're on this topic of kind of sort of the biohacking, which I know you've had so much experience with, are there any sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, top three or a couple of these uh, modalities that you've really enjoyed doing or that you'd recommend for the majority of people, what, what have been sort of the the hacks, if you will, that have 
been the biggest, um, you know, game changers for you or needle movers. Yeah. Um, I keep doing this, but first just to comment briefly on the <laughs> yeah. omegas. Um, I, so th- th- that is one that I am so perpetually torn about. I like, yeah. I, I think about it all the time, um, because I agree with you so much. The omega three to omega six ratio today of people's diets is it's, I mean, it's awful. Um, yeah, yeah like it should historically they'll say, they say it's between one to one to one to four for, um, omega three to omega six. And now it's like up to like one to 20 yeah. omega three to omega six. And, um, so I, that's actually a, a primary reason that, cause I eat a really high protein diet, but it's the majority of it is fish, um, yeah. low, low mercury. Um, cause I, I'm, that's something else I'm really passionate about is the, the potential for mercury toxicity because I experienced that myself. Um, so I really like making all of my protein, a favorable, um, omega three, omega six ratio. And I, I like that because it's so interesting. Cause like with the omega threes, the reason I'm so torn is there are people on both sides of the camp. Like Rhonda Patrick talks about it all the time and I'll listen to her shows and be like, Oh yeah, I need to be like high dosing omega three supplements. <laughs> but then on the flip side, you have people who say that like, you know, in any that we, that we really only need like very minimal amounts and that they're inflammatory and, um, even like omega threes because of how fragile they are with their oxidation potential. So I'm like, so I'm so torn about it. And then I get really nervous because, um, so I do think if you have a, you know, cold shipped omega three supplement, that's really high quality that has not oxidized. I think that's probably a safe bet and probably helpful, but so many people are just, you know, ordering omega three supplements off Amazon and things like (laughs) that. And I mean, just think about how hot they probably got. And so they're probably, oxidized. And yeah, so I'm, I'm like torn by this. I I would one day like to make an omega-3 supplement, but I'd have to be so intense about like cold shipping and, and things like that. Um, so what was your go-to then on the non sort of mercury? Are you a sardine person? Speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So I have thought about this so much and I actually have a pretty controversial perspective on this, (laughs) I think, um, because a lot of people will be like all wild caught fish all the time. Um, I actually, so if you look at there's not a lot of recent literature. There's some really good um, literature on mercury levels of fish, um, like pretty much every species you can find, but it's like from 2000, I think 12, which is really annoying. I can't find a more updated database, but but there's also a lot of studies on farm versus wild. And in general, uh, farm fish tends to be lower in mercury, which is really interesting. So I'm actually a fan of, well, the bottom of the totem pole. So like shrimp and scallops, um, tend to be very low. So I love those. And I think it's okay. Wild caught or farmed. Um, and then I eat a lot of two, two farmed options. Um, so Australia Sparamundi, I, uh, have you had that, that fish before? No, I haven't. I haven't. So I love it. It's so delicious. It's actually, so Sparamundi is actually has the highest omega-3 content of any white fish. So it's white, um, still high in omega-3s, but it's also lean and it's so good, but that they are sustainably farmed raised. And because the majority of mercury in a fish comes from the fish's diet, um, Mm -hmm. when you have sustainably farmed raised, responsibly raised fish, they actually are lower in mercury. So the Australia Sparamundi is tested to be mercury free. So I, I love that. I eat that a lot of nights. Um, and then I actually like vetting and finding re- responsibly farmed, really sustainable salmon. Um, I actually prefer that to wild caught just because of my heavy metal concerns with wild caught salmon. Um, so I, I trust whole foods, for example, and, um, there's this other brand that thrive market has that I really like. So, I eat a lot of, a lot of those fishes, but I think it's, so here's like a picture for listeners. If they're not like con- taking it that seriously, the mercury, if you look at the the data on mercury and fish, if you take, and I understand this is the extremes, but if you were to take a piece of tilapia, which is low mercury and take like the piece of tilapia with the lowest amount of mercury and compare it to like a piece of swordfish with the highest amount, it could be like one piece of swordfish could be the equivalent of eating 300 pieces of tilapia in like one meal. Um, which is how I think how I partly got into my toxicity. <laughs> so I just don't want people to take mercury toxicity lightly because it's not fun when you have it. Yeah. Um, 
So, but I love fish. So, so no, so no anchovies or sardines for you. None of these really small fish that tend to not have a lot of mercury. You don't like them or what? I, what's I actually taste? haven't. Um, they're, I think that they're too fatty tasting for me. <laughs> they're, um, they're acquired taste maybe. <laughs> yeah. You know, but you know what, come to think of it. I don't even know. I don't even know if I've I'm sure I've had them, but I'm not sure. I'll have to go get a, you know what? I will report back. I'm, I'm going to get I'm, some. Yeah. Report back. And I'm going to make some recommendations. If you get, oh, please do. Yeah. If you can get them from the source, for example, I was just in Portugal and oh my gosh, I, it was a different animal altogether. Like I've had sardines before I've had anchovies, things like that. And they were nothing like what I was able to get over there. And so I will, I'm going to get that exact specification of the one that I was eating for a while. And I, it's just the shipping can be a little bit hectic depending on, you know, where yeah. you are in the world. Hawaii is a, the worst place ever to ship stuff to. So <laughs> I wasn't eating them in Hawaii, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's some that are way better than others. And generally speaking, I mean, when you just think about the cycle, right, they get it from the diet. So the bigger, the fish like swordfish, you mentioned they're eating smaller fish and then, small, you know, and then, so it just stacks up over time and it accumulates. And so you're more likely to get it in these fish that are the bigger sort of, um, higher up on the food chain, if you will, type of fish than eating the very small, either sardine types. And, and even like, if you're into, you said salmon, I don't know if you ever do like salmon eggs, or if you do any of the other sort of caviar type of stuff, I I've only done that occasionally. And I haven't found a great source, but those also can be a great omega-3 source as well. Have you tried those varieties, the, the eggs? I, I, I always, I know I should, I see it at whole foods all the time. Like, you know, I should really, cause especially when I hear people talk about it, apparently it's just like a nutritional powerhouse. So I, you know, you've, you've inspired me next time I go to whole foods, I'm going <laughs> to, well, just, or yeah. let me know if you find out that, that, um, that sardine brand or, yeah. um, I'm, I'm all about like I, the, the, the links I've gone to, to ship myself crazy things. Like I remember there was, there was this, uh, sauerkraut company I loved when I lived in LA and then I moved to Atlanta and they didn't have it. And like the amount I paid for shipping just ship me like uh, small little jars of fermented <laughs> foods. But, um, yeah, no, I'm all about these, these powerhouse nutritional foods. They can be. So, so in that protein, do you ever do liver? Liver is probably the most nutrient dense thing that you could ever find. Are you a liver fan or once in a while or not so much? I have this huge question about liver that I have asked so many people. And my question is, I'd be curious your thoughts on this. Um, so liver, like you said, it's supposedly the most, you know, nutrient dense, amazing thing for us. I don't understand why, because I remember I really cleaned up my diet. I went paleo and then I went through a period of time where I was really anemic and I was like, and I hadn't had liver since I was young. And when I was little, I, I, my family is, um, my lineage is German. So we were always eating like liverwurst growing up with my <laughs> German grandmother, which is not you know, it's like processed and like yeah, salty yeah. and like delicious and tastes nothing like normal liver. Um, so I remember when I was really anemic and paleo and I was like, okay, I'm going to go get a, like some liver and it's going to taste delicious because literally it's exactly what my body needs right now. And it tasted, and I love like <laughs> everything. It tasted so awful. And I, and I'm, I don't know why that is because I find that most people I talk to, don't like the taste of liver, even people who are really whole foods based. And I'm just haunted by this question because if it's so good for us, I don't know why we don't naturally like just flock to it or really any of the organs. Um, yeah. And I don't know if it's my theory, although I've asked people, like I asked Chris Masterj on this. Um, my theory is that maybe, maybe it's something like it's too nutrient in. So maybe there's the concern of like uh, nutrient toxicity, but I don't know. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, like no, why? that's, de that's definitely a part of it. You don't, this is not something you want to eat every night. I mean, I'm kind of a, you know, maybe once a week or every couple of weeks and you don't eat a lot of it. It's not like you eat pounds of this stuff. You eat very little bits at a time. And it is actually can be a little bit challenging to cook. I kind of just sear it. I don't really cook it. The more you cook it, the kind of more foul it tastes. I, I, I had the same experience as you as a kid. My my folks, I, I'm also from German descent. We not only did the liver worse, but we actually bought chicken liver all the time and we mm. cooked it up and it tasted horrible. Like that was my least favorite meal ever. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I kind of had an aversion to it for many, many years. I'm like, no way I'm not touching that stuff. And then I'm, you know, kind of doing the research and, and whatnot. And I'm like, well, it is the most nutrient dense thing out there. And 
supposedly our ancestors for millennia fought over this kind of yeah. thing and they sent the, you know, scraps to the dogs and they fought over the organ meats. And, you know, that's what they tell us all and whatnot, but I just can't figure out how to make this thing more palatable. And, and so <laughs> it's not, it's not a daily thing. It's, it's often only every, you know, several weeks type of thing. And it's, it's definitely, there's a challenge, I think. And, and my, I agree with you. My thoughts were exactly what you said that it purposefully maybe doesn't taste amazing because we're not supposed to eat too much of it mm. because you can kind of overdose, if you will, if you do too much of the organ meats, especially liver, because there are a few things in there besides just the heme part that you're kind of alluding to for anemia, but there are, um, chromium, there's actually, you know, vitamin a there's, there's yeah, lots of fat things soluble in vitamins that can, yeah, that can be problematic, uh, in overdose. And, and I don't think it's almost rare to find anybody ever overdose because most people don't eat it at all. And then, <laughs> and then even if you do, you don't eat it that often. So it's, it's rare to see it, but I think part of the reason it doesn't taste amazing is because we're not supposed to eat it every day, but <laughs> I think there's definitely benefits. And so there's also, as you know, there's many companies out there, that are freeze drying it and putting it in supplement form kind of thing. And, you know, it's available in many different ways. I'm, I'm still kind of, I like to do more of the actual thing and cook it and not have to get it out of a supplement, but it's definitely out there. It's an option. And I just feel like it's probably tasting that way because we're not supposed to eat a ton of it. <laughs> so yeah. I share, I share that. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I actually, it's funny the other a few weeks ago, I got a whole, I think it was a Branzino at a restaurant and, and it still had the head and like the brain and everything. <laughs> and I don't think I'd had fish brain before. And I was like, this brain is going to taste amazing. It didn't, it didn't taste awful, but it didn't taste like amazing. So I was like, I, I don't know what's going on here. Um, but, um, I do take the, um, so actually the, the thing I found most effective because my anemia, when I had, when I was really anemic, I mean, I could have died. Like I walked into the hospital and they were like, how are you walking in here right now? Um, I don't know how I got that anemic, but in any case, um, I do now, the thing that I find that works really well is I do take desiccated spleen, which actually has way more yeah. iron than even liver. Um, and like you, like you mentioned, I do like that. It's, I mean, it's basically just the real thing. Cause it's just freeze dried. Yeah. Um, so I take kidney every night. There, there's so many different organs, but I take kidney every night for the histamine. I find it so beneficial for its antihistamine effect. Um, and I take the, the spleen every couple of days for, for the iron, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome because I think we live in a day and age where it's so cool how these kinds of things are available to us, whereas they didn't used to be so readily available. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, spleen is great. I mean, that's where sort of the, the blood filters through coalesces the immune system. That's a huge part of it is the spleen. And so, yeah, it's definitely in the category of super beneficial organ meats, if you will. And I think it's great that it's available that way now. So that that's so cool. Um, I wanted to ask you too, like, are you big into the, you know, like cold plunge thing, the sauna that like, what are the other types of sort of biohacks that you like personally that have really helped you with your health? Oh yeah. I never even see, this is my problem. I get on so many tangents. Yeah. I never even got to your question about the three things. Yeah. Um, so I, love cold and I love sauna. I do every single day. So right before this, I was doing some cryotherapy. Um, so I do, I do, I do cold shower blasts. Um, and then I do cryotherapy every day. Um, the one I go to it's okay. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, describe that because when you say cryotherapy, our minds go, okay, it's cold, but like, just tell us more about what yeah, you're doing. Sure. Um, well, for people who are more interested, um, I've had Wim Hof on my show and he's like the most inspiring, amazing, incredible individual ever. Like who, if you ever want to be motivated to do cold exposure, just look at any of Wim's content because <laughs> yeah. he's Agreed. amazing. He's a legend. <laughs> um, but in any case, so the cryotherapy machines, they're becoming more and more popular and there's, um, two, I mean, there's probably like three main types that people might experience. There's, um, nitrogen based ones that use nitrogen, um, and they can either be immersive where your head is in it or non-immersive where your head is out, out of it. And then there's electric, electric ones that don't use nitrogen. Um, but in any case you go into the machine and it gets to a certain temperature for however long you're going in. So the one I go to every day almost is nitrogen based and it's immersive and it's negative 270 degrees for three minutes. And, um, it just feels so good. Um, I find it to be very anti-inflammatory when I wear a CGM. Um, 
there, well, so I don't know the reason for this. I think it's because the CGM is just freaking out from the cold <laughs> exposure because when I go in, it spikes really, really high. And I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's from like uh, the stress response or if it's, like I said, the sensor freaking out, it's so high that I think it's the sensor freaking out. Um, but after that, um, my blood sugars go down for the rest of the day, which is really incredible. And, um, I, I I'm excited for there to be more studies on cold exposure because right now on between cold exposure and sauna, there's so much research on sauna, but there's, um, not that much on the cold, but they're doing more and more. And what I have seen has been um, pretty favorable. Like there's a, there's a good study on cryotherapy machines specifically and, uh, people with depression and the antidepressant effects, which, um, was very, uh, motivating because it basically does release endorphins and dopamine and feel good compounds. Um, so yeah, so I love that. I do that daily. Um, and again, like I mentioned, people could do cold showers. I actually haven't done a cold plunge, which I know is crazy because people probably think that I'm like the first person to have done that. But I, I just, I don't have a machine and I haven't been anywhere where there is one. Uh, do you do ice baths? I yeah, guess I could so, do an ice bath, but yeah, I've done more of the ice bath. I don't own sort of a cold plunge that I can dial in the temperature. I, I joke with people that I was besides Wim Hof, you know, who's just amazing. And I echo everything you said about him, but I grew up in Northern California and I got in 52 degree ocean water mm. every day of my life. And it did amazing things for me. And I then moved to Hawaii. I got to experience what it's like to not be in cold water. And <laughs> I haven't really gone back to that environment per se, but I've done the ice bath in my own bathtub and and that sort of thing. And I've done cold plunges in, in spas and fitness centers that have them, but I, I don't personally own one when I'm out in places that are very cold. I like to actually get down to my usual, you know, board shorts that I would wear surfing and I'll just lay in the snow and oh. I'll kind of do the snow angel basically yeah. you know, make it other than whatever's covering, you know, my board shorts. And then I'll flip over and I'll do it the other way. And I get the ice cream headache. I feel like I'm getting that sort of effect, but I haven't I'm still kind of on the fence of whether I want to buy one for the house. Um, I kind of would like to, but I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done it like every single day. Those that do, they rave about it and it seems super reasonable and doable. I mean, many of us have hot tubs. Why not mm -hmm. have a, a cold plunge too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have, I'm in an apartment right now, but once I'm like in an actual house, I, I definitely want to get some sort of cold plunge. Um, I just know like on the flip side with the sauna stuff, I, I do that every night and I just find that to be so profound for so many health benefits. Um, you know, they've done so many studies, especially in like Finland and, um, and like the Nordic cultures where they're, uh, doing sauna and the, like the cardiovascular benefits are just insane. I mean, it's basically, you can make the case that it's equivalent to cardiovascular exercise for, for the heart benefits. And I find the detox effects to be amazing and, you know, just the sweating and the relaxation and pain relief. And so I, I do a nightly infrared sauna session every night. Do you, um, do, oh, you do sauna? Okay. Yeah. I love sauna. And I was just about to ask you that. Do you do, you know, if, if you do like a dry sauna, just heat sauna type thing, or you do the infrared, um, or you do the steam sauna. Is there one that you like best? Sounds like you do the infrared mostly, but, um, what have been your experiences with the others as well? The steam versus the dry versus the infrared. Yeah, I've done, um, on occasion, probably like a dry sauna just at like gyms and things like yeah. that. Um, I, I just really like the infrared because you, basically it's heating you from the inside out. So it's a lower temperature, but you're still getting as the, you know, the therapeutic effects. Um, and I have a, a sunlight and solo unit, which is one that you lay down inside of. And I love it because your head's outside of it. So I can like do work and read books and stuff while in it every night. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I love sauna. I think it's really, really great. Um, that's something else that Rhonda Patrick talks about all the time. So yeah, sauna, going back to your question about like the three things, I think sauna and cold probably would have been two of, the, you know, two out of the three. So, yeah. Yeah. Any, any other kind of, I know we're getting close to the hour, so I want to respect your time. Any other sort of parting uh, comments with respect to either biohacking or any other sort of health wisdom that you've gleaned in, in all your experience, anything else you'd like to share? Um, yeah, I guess just like rapid fire, the other biohacking things that I love that people can look into and that I think are so important. 
Um, I'm really big. We we talked we talked about this earlier, but I just think sleep is so so important. So anything you can do to support your sleep, I'm so jealous of people that just like fall asleep and just stay asleep and then wake up like <laughs> bright eyed and bushy tailed. Yeah. Um, that is not me. Um, <laughs> but I, I find that if I really honor all of my sleep habits and really make my sleep sacred, I I can sleep pretty well. At least my aura ring says I'm sleeping well. Um, so I think things like wearing blue light blocking glasses at night, using red light therapy to um, wake up in the morning and uh, wind down at night, keeping your room at night cold, using blackout curtains. I use a cooling mattress. I use the Uller. That's a game changer for me. Um, and then uh, just other things in general, I mean, there's like so many things and I'm always trying new things, but, um, I'll just stop myself from going like on all the tangents. I think mindset though is really important. So, um, just having like gratitude and trying to, you know, live with kindness. I just find that like, you can't go wrong (laughs) with that. Um, so I, I mean, it's ironic because, I, I know like meditation is like the thing I've never actually done. Like I've never really found a meditation practice that works for me, but I do find that like cultivating gratitude and gratitude journals and focusing on mindset is really, really important. I think for health and longevity. Yeah, no. So important. My, my wind down every evening has one of those things. It's either I like to like you, I read a book or I do a gratitude journal or some sort of I'm not big into like the super structured meditation. Like I have to do 60 minutes right now and it has to be this Mm -hmm. position. I have to say this word. Like, I don't know. I've never really. That stressed me out when I was trying it. (laughs) Me too. And some people do amazing with that, but I'm more of a, I'll go for a walk with obviously no earbuds in my ear or headphones or cell phone or anything. I'll go for a walk in nature. If it's in an environment that I can do so barefoot, I do that. And I just like to give myself that sort of, you know, white space, white noise, whatever it is, and just give myself the chance to think and to let my mind drift and whatever that is for me on that day, whether it be just a simple walk outside could be in my very own neighborhood or on the beach, if I have the opportunity or somewhere in the woods and barefoot, even better if I can. Um, but yeah, I, I, the meditative thing kind of stressed me out too, for two reasons. One, it's like, Oh my gosh, like I can't imagine, like I have to sit still in this position and get exactly my feet centered in this way and then say a certain word. Like it to me was, it was too much for, for that reason. And I just, I don't know, I tried it and some versions work better than others for certain people. But what I, what I found is you can change your whole state in literally six breaths. Like it can be that fast. Mm. And if you can do the longer periods of time, then great. I mean, you mentioned Wim Hof. He's great with the breathing as well as the cold exposure. And you can glean so much from just simple breath work. And then, you know, just go for a little walk. Like, don't feel like it has to be complicated. I think sometimes in this world, we make things more complicated than they have to be. And so I appreciate your wisdom with just being kind, like just the simple stuff. You'll never, I promise you, you'll never regret being kind. And maybe that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned coming up on 50 is just, just be kind, be nice, be be genuine. It's like the simple thing. So thank you so much, Melanie, for being here. I really have enjoyed this and I would love for our listeners to reach out to you, connect with you, follow you, support you. So let us know how we can do that. Sure. So, um, first of all, thank you for having me. This has been so, so wonderful. Um, so all of my content, I have the Melanie Avalon biohacking podcast and the intermittent fasting podcast. So the websites for that are melanieavalon.com and I have podcast.com. And then the supplement line that I developed, which was just to, cause I'm so suspicious of the supplement industry. And I wanted to make literally the best forms of all the supplements that they're going to be. Um, that's avalonx.us. You can get everything there. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm pretty much just Melanie Avalon everywhere. And I have three Facebook groups that people can join me. If you just type in Melanie Avalon groups in Facebook, they'll, they'll all come up. So yeah, I think uh, that's all the things. That's that's amazing. And and you are easy to find. I mean, you're exactly right. If you just type your name on any platform, like whether it be slightly nuanced, it'll come up. So Mel- Melanie, thank you so much. I'll put all that in the show notes. It's been such a pleasure to spend this uh, hour with you. Thank you so much and aloha mm-hmm. to you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss out on any future episode. And I'd love to hear your comments and feedback. If there's any topic you'd love to hear about, you're dying to know, burning questions, 
please comment below and let me know what future topics are of interest to you.